and you're going to be doing part of it, and you saw the you saw the um, the, the full title. You can see the full title. Um, I'm trying to focus on uh, the way in which we can change society through um, archaeology linked with education. Um, I've been to all the sessions so far here, and for every session I've thought, well, you know, you've presented the problem, the answer clearly is education. If you don't do the education, you don't get rid of the, you don't get rid of the problem. I was a bit stuck this morning with people breaking into the um, National Museum uh, in Iraq and stealing things. I wasn't quite sure how to get my head around what kind of education uh, program you would work out to avoid this or to cure it. But give me a bit of time. I think I, I, I have, after all, worked in Turkmenistan, which I'm not going to talk about today. My doctor tells me that I must keep my blood pressure as low as I can, and working in Turkmenistan certainly made it shoot up. So um, I'm going to uh, say something about um, my, my views on the uh, breadth and the width of, uh, and the depth of uh, archaeology and how that uh, can be linked with education. Uh, and get this said, I, I started as a teacher in secondary school. I always wanted to be an archaeologist. And in fact, I was digging since before I went to school, went to secondary school. But my careers officer in my school said, you'll never get a job as an archaeologist, so I wouldn't bother with that if I were you. Unfortunately, I don't do this anymore. I never take notice of anything anyone tells me nowadays, apart from my wife. Um, uh, and I, I decided, you know, I couldn't be an archaeologist, so I became a teacher. And I've, I've kind of regretted it sometimes, but not always, because I've been able to turn that to my advantage and, and find a place um, in archaeology and, and in education. Um, and archaeology, of course, is, as you know, uh, a lot of archaeologists here, um, has changed enormously. You know, when I started in archaeology in the 60s, um, we, we used pencils and measured things and drew on, drew on bits of paper. Um, now we have digital recording uh, we'd never heard of uh, carbon-14 dating, it hadn't been invented yet. There's all sorts of really interesting and important changes that were, were being made. Unfortunately, there's also been lots of changes in education, sometimes, for the, sometimes I think, for the, for the worse. But as archaeology has, has changed, um, people have had to kind of catch up with it. Um, and they've caught up with it in a number of different ways. And one important way now is through, uh, is through television programs. I mean, in particular in, uh, in the UK, and I'm speaking mostly about the UK today. Um, and they know certain things, but they don't know everything. So there's a, ro there's a, a role within education to explain what archaeologists do how they do it, why they do it, and why, it, and why it's important. One thing that um, hasn't changed, I think, is that the tradition in, in the UK, and in some other countries, but not universally, has been that archaeologists or antiquarians from the 17th century onwards were very keen to explain to other people what they did and what they'd found. And that's still true today. And I think without that, we're kind of finished as a profession. If we don't go on saying, where are our new publics? Who do we need to, who do we need to talk to? Um, so I've chosen for my slides 
my slide for the, the, the first slide, um, this one, uh, which is excavations in, uh, in London, uh, in the Barbican area of London. This is the city of London, the sm very small part which uh, is contained within the Roman walled town. The wall's not there um, in, in any quantity now. Um, very heavily bombed during the Second World War, as you can see. There's a photograph from the 19, 1940s. Virtually nothing, nothing there. And it, it gave the opportunity for the first time, really, in the UK for what later became known as rescue excavations or salvage excavations, um, which were uh, produced unannounced by the digging of bomb sites and the revealing of archaeological sites underneath. And the most famous for us in the, in the UK uh, is the Temple of Mithras. Um, and it's famous because um, enormous numbers of people visited the site, a lot of it unannounced. And over the period of excavation, 400,000 people visited. I bet there's not a single archaeologist in this room, including me, who has carried out an excavation in which they can say, yes, and on our open days, we had 400,000 people. Um, so it was, a, it was an, amazing, uh, an amazing event. And it was an amazing event in, in two ways. One was that there grew uh, within the 1950s when, um, when development was taking place, um, this kind of tradition of office workers, because this is, this is the place for vast numbers of office workers, to come out at lunchtime and look at the builders doing the work. That's what, they, that's what they did in their lunch hour, ate their sandwiches and looked at builders. And then suddenly, they're not builders there, there are archaeologists there. So they came and looked at archaeologists using similar tools in some ways. And then the Museum of London, as it later became, um, opened up the site and did tours, which you can... You can see that it's not very good it's, um, uh, photograph to start with, but you can probably see it better on, on there, yes. Um, <clears throat> they, did these, they did these tours because they wanted um, people to, un, you know, to understand what they were doing and see the, uh, you know, the treasures, if you like, some wonderful objects which are now in the, now in the Museum of London. So they, they did tours. Um, and people queued for hours to come, come to these tours. So I see, I see this as one of the sort of stepping stones in, in archaeological education. So for me, education is not um, just about schools. I hate the word school service. You know, when I was in English heritage and running the education service, and. I had people, including the chairman and the chief executive, um, you know, ask me if I had a school service. As far as I was concerned, that was it. I was never going to speak to them again because it's, a, it's kind of insult to say that education is just about schools and perhaps just about primary schools. So I want to go on from that. So, before I get into the main, into the main part, um, I put on here some, uh, some photographs of different elements of, uh, of, ed of education and archaeology. On the top left, um, there's a photograph of a new initiative by the Museum of London. Uh, well, new for them, but it's no, by no means a new, a new idea, uh, which they've called a time truck. You've got to have a tricksy kind of name, otherwise it doesn't work in, in the UK. Um, but it's, it's a jolly good idea, and they tow this um, trailer uh, into places they can get it into uh, in London generally, but in particular in the city, um, and then invite 
schools mostly, but they do other work as well, to come and do activities. Um, it, the word outreach is the word that describes this kind of work. It is not, it's not a new idea at all. It's been going on since the, well, I think probably since the 70s. Um, people buying London buses and turning them into experimental uh, laboratories, not just for archaeology, but for other, other things as well. Um, but I'm glad to see it revived, and especially by the, by the Museum of London. Um, so that's one, one form of outreach, which I consider to be part of education. Um, uh, on the, um, let's go now, uh, on the bottom uh, left, just a photograph of, of a classroom to say that a, a major part of uh, archaeology and education uh, is within the formal sector. Um, I suppose I'm biased because that's where I worked originally, but my firm belief, having run a, a major education service in, in English heritage as, as, as was, uh, is that um, you need to start, like the Jesuits, with the young. You know, let's forget for the moment about very old people like me. I mean, it's, it's not worth spending good money on someone as old as me because you're not going to get a return. You will get a return if you start with children. And in particular, it's my view that uh, you will get a better return if you start with them in schools for various reasons. One is that they are a captive audience. Another is that if you do the right kind of education service, I mean, that's, you know, my definition of the right education service is that you teach teachers, not pupils. You don't stand on your site and say, come on, all you children, I'm going to give you a really exciting time and show you things on this site and then bye-bye in half an hour. What's that achieved? Well, of course it's achieved enthusing children if the people doing it are any good. But what happens, we used to say in English heritage, when the nice Jane Smith, who was working at our site as an education person, stops working? The class comes with the teacher and the teacher says, Oh, last time I brought my class, the nice, what was she called? Oh, Jane Smith. She was really good with my children. Sorry, she's not here anymore. So what happens with the archaeological education of the children? Well, usually nothing. However, if you take the nice Miss Jones, who is teaching the children and bringing them to the site, then you've achieved years of teaching children her own children, her own classes on site. So formal education is important, and I'll start with that in a moment. On the top right, I'm going to, going to look briefly at um, learning outdoors. Uh, as archaeologists and heritage managers, we need to get people uh, from the formal sector not just within primary schools, but beyond that, to come to the sites and learn from them. The problem is, it's certainly true in the UK, and I haven't found it to be untrue anywhere else, is that when teachers are trained, they are not trained to teach outdoors, out of the classroom. They're taught to teach children sitting in classrooms. And you have to take different approaches Clearly, you have to take different approaches uh, if you're taking them outside of the classroom. Um, so I want to look briefly at that. Those children there are looking at part of their own um, environment, uh, the, the urban environment that, that they live in. The bottom right represents uh, a section I want to look at on community archaeology, which is now developing very fast in the UK it has developed already in, in the States uh, a long time ago, and less so in some other, some other countries. Uh, but it takes various forms. 
And this is an interesting form, I think, this, uh, this um, uh, uh, poster, uh, which is a hill fort um, in UK terms, is a, is a fortified settlement either on a hill or on a created hill, uh, which defends a settlement from, uh, from uh, late prehistoric times, usually. Um, it's under threat, this particular one was under threat from, uh, from housing development which was going to encroach on it. And the community, not the archaeologists, the community said, hang on, enough is enough. We don't want our hill fort destroyed. We don't want it encroached on. And so communities, in some, a few communities have, have, uh, have come up with good ideas and this one was to ring the entire hill fort and no mean feet because it's pretty big hold hands and hug it but what it did of course was to provide publicity so the, those are some of the, uh, the things I wanted to I wanted to be dealing with and I want to uh, do a, a number of sections um, starting with the curriculum and going on to learning outdoors, looking at objects and the use of, of objects, excavation for children um, in various ways, to come back to community archaeology and see what's being done there. And then I want to take three case studies, uh, different types of case studies, uh, which will um, uh, illuminate, illuminate that. So. I want to start with formal, formal education and uh, what I'm encouraging archaeologists to do and what we did in, in English Heritage and I'm still doing in the Institute of Archaeology in London is to, is to look at the curriculum, the detailed curriculum of what the state, the country, says teachers have got to do and we look particularly at history sometimes a bit of geography, um, but we would certainly be looking at a number of other subjects and looking for ways of saying to teachers, well, you could go to a castle or a Roman villa um, and you could do history, but your curriculum will also allow you to do drama and music and, and geography and mathematics. And we produced in English Heritage a book for teachers for every single curriculum subject linked to the historic environment. And that seems to me to be one of the ways in which you can, you can influence. Um, I'm, going, I'm taking two um, curricula uh, because they're advanced, advanced curricula. A lot of curricula is, is very old fashioned. I mean, even in Western countries which have redeveloped and developed their curricula, they're still very old-fashioned. And by old-fashioned, I think I, I probably uh, mean the bell rings and they stop doing maths and they run along the corridor and they do geography. And the bell rings again and they run along the corridor and do religious studies or something. Everything is compartmentalized. It's very difficult to introduce uh, to teachers the idea of doing a project across the curriculum if you're having to talk to 12 different teachers. Um, well, some countries, and, and here's one of them, Scotland, has a much more advanced uh, curricula in which they do not take individual subjects, they take themes or groups of subjects. And this has another advantage in that both here and, your, and you'll see also in the, uh, in the States, um, that it would generally, history, which is where archaeology is most safely lodged, um, is usually within social uh, studies. It's not always called social studies, but that's what it is. And that's useful because the teacher in Scotland, this is both primary and secondary schools, um, will need to teach what in, 
in the UK we call citizenship studies. Um, it's not the same, quite same meaning as it is in as it is in the states. Uh, but here it's all in the one. So you can be dealing with some of those questions that we've covered already in this conference, and you could certainly do the stealing of of objects and the sale of objects and the destruction of sites as part of uh, the, the, the curriculum. Easier if you do it, if you do it like this. Um, so what you find with these new curricula as opposed to previous ones, and some of you will undoubtedly have suffered a curriculum which is based on out-of-date textbooks writing by hand from the blackboard, learning facts. We all know there aren't any facts. They don't exist. They're only interpretations. This kind of curriculum will, um, if it's done properly, um, <clears throat> will encourage teachers to get their children, their students, to think like archaeologists. So I'm going to try to encourage archaeologists to say, first of all, can you remember what it feels like to be an archaeologist? Can you think about what archaeology is about? It's not just digging. It's not just dating. It's certainly not just objects. It's wider. And it's not just wider in landscape terms. It's also uh, wider in the sense of um, we have to interpret everything that we produce before we can tell people what, it, what we think it is. And we don't often enough say, we think this is something or other. We say, it is something or other. So a good curriculum will allow teachers to take up the generous offer from archaeologists to have um, material resources and, and visits and museums to have displays which say don't uh, which, which don't just say oh come in and look at all these precious objects I went to one site in Greece just a couple of weeks ago which I won't mention new museum um, and my friend I, I went with as an archaeologist said well, there's a jolly good example of, a, of an art historical museum. Brand new museum, full of very nice objects, with no explanation at all about what any of them were, and certainly nothing to say these are interpretations. So you can see there on this, this is just part of material which is produced for teachers of things they should do. So the key words are evidence in evaluation, interpretation, changes over time, that, that kind of thing. And the other, the other one is uh, from another one of my favorite uh, curricula from, uh, from Colorado, which you can see there, social studies includes the subjects of history, geography, economics, and civics, which is in the UK we call, we call citizenship. And because they're linked together, although I suspect quite often being taught separately, uh, it allows the educational authorities to provide um, ways of teaching this and materials, materials to do it. And if you're wanting to see really good materials that come out of curricula like this, you simply need to type in national parks or National Park Service, and look at the stuff which is produced there. It's, it's excellent, um, and much better than a lot of, lot of other places. So enough of formal, if you like, although this is formal but outside. The top slide is really just an illustration, but it is a school party at a Roman site in, in, in England called St Albans. Roman site and then a uh, and then a medieval medieval town in a park. It's not an archaeological park. It just had a park built around the built around the, the remains which were excavated. But it's the favourite place to go. 
And the thing that we, uh, I always say to teachers and to my students, some of whom become teachers, is that teachers need to um, bear in mind three phra phrases when they're, uh, when they're going to work outside the classroom. And work outside the classroom could mean going to a zoo, it could mean going to a shopping center, it could mean going to an archaeological site or a museum or whatever. The three things are before the visit, on the visit, and after the visit. What are you going to do as a teacher to cover all those three things, which are not um, of the same length? You have to design what you're going to do to introduce your children or your students or your adults before you go. What are you going to do when you get there? What are your strategies? What are you going to do when you come back? And that must be based on, on um, very clearly thought out ideas for how you want to educate your, uh, your students. Um, on the, uh, the bottom slides are, are a variety of, of outdoor venues. I've avoided straight archaeological sites for the, for the moment. The, the historic environment, as we would call it, and then on the far right, a group of children wearing high-vis jackets so they don't get knocked down by a, a lorry while they're visiting the site. You can always spot a school party in England, that's what they wear, um, visiting a museum. And I know from this visit, because I followed it around and peeked at the, peeked at the children and the teachers, I could see that the teacher had thoroughly prepared um, that visit. The middle one, though, is different and touches uh, on the, the, the point of title of the, of the uh, lecture, if you like, which is a, a, a series of projects we did in English Heritage with schools across the country, which aimed at looking at the, the problems that you might have by living in and being in a historic environment. And these students were looking at the possibilities of change within a historic town. And most towns in the UK have uh, 19, very large 19th century developments. So there's always uh, something to look at archaeologically, providing you allow archaeology and history to stretch up to the present day and back as far as you, as far as you can go. And they were making a film because they were they found concerns about the use of historic buildings um, by putting up signs and you know flashing lights and whatever, and that was their that was their work. Um, working using objects has become extremely popular uh, in, in the UK, and to I think a lesser extent elsewhere. Um, this is mostly because archaeologists, historians, and history teachers uh, made huge fuss about the introduction of a new of a curriculum in uh, 1999 and then 2000 onwards. We never had a curriculum before. There was never a written down curriculum in the UK, and uh, we made a lot of fuss and a lot of talking to ministers and very important people and got them to put in the kind of things we wanted. And one of those was the use of, the use of handling objects, which museums, of course, are used to doing. And you'll see some examples of that. that on the left is Young Archaeologist Club, which I um, co-founded, and which we still run a branch of. It's a voluntary-led um, organization. Um, and on the right, uh, uh, another project um, from the east of England that I was involved in called the Garbology Project, taking the word garbology from the famous garbology project in America and using it as an excuse to say archaeology is rubbish. You know, we all know that. Archaeology is full of rubbish. Archaeologists looking at rubbish all the time. It's very rarely they're not actually looking at rubbish, i.e. things that are, th are thrown away. So objects is very important. And here are some examples of students using objects. Um, uh, quite often they're allowed to 
use objects by handling them while they're washing them or cleaning them. So they're doing an archaeological archaeological process, which is what's what's happening here um, on the uh, on the right right hand side. Um, and in the centre, there are students from from London near where my university is. Um, with a school who were doing science with older students and wanted to include some archaeology in. So we provided them with um, learning ideas and took some of my students there with bones from our own collection so they could do some, some real work. Um, on the left is, a, I think, a, it's got a more extreme example and one I admire very much at Monte Alban in, in Mexico where... Um, a very dynamic director um, wanted to make sure that education was you know, part of what people did to change people's attitudes to archaeology and got, by means I don't know, the uh, director of education to, for, for the um, state or the area to introduce the idea that students studying social studies were required, had to, attend the site and do some practical work, in this case, uh, cleaning, cleaning pottery, unheard of there. So it's part of the social studies background. Excavation for children is, is, is a sore point for lots of archaeologists. I, I know more archaeologists who will tell me that they can't have children on their sites because it's, it's illegal, it's, um, uh, it's against health and safety, it's uh, dangerous, it, it's nothing of the sort if held in the light way. What they mean is they don't like children and they don't want them on the site. And I think this is nothing other than stupid. I think the people you do want on site are children, but in the right kind of way. Now. What used to be the right kind of way was what's happening here in, the, in this picture on the right. Actually, this is, was, he's retired now, the chief archaeologist from English heritage. And you can be absolutely certain he's boring the hell out of these children, telling them a jolly good thing about the site, using not a single word which they would understand. So usually, and we do this with visitors too, usually come and look at the excavation means come and look at the excavation. You can't walk on it. You can't see anyone doing anything. Um, on the left is a project which from the photograph appears we're doing the same thing. But it's a project we did across the country with different types of sites in which children were taking part and they got an opportunity to, to do some excavation or to do landscape work. Uh, it varies, of course. But <clears throat> there are places that, apart from my own sites, in which I've always had um, children working as archaeologists, not just cleaning pottery, um, who've set up situations for school parties and also individual children with parents of outreach work. And the Museum of London has led this, um, uh, this kind of idea. They've set up over, over the years a research excavation each year, which coincides with the end of the school term and the beginning of the holiday, summer holiday. So that what the, what the visitors are doing, both adult and children, are, is real archaeology uh, as part of research work and they can see that all the way through to publication and sometimes display in, in a museum. Um, on, the, on the right is the excavation that colleagues and I did uh, in, in a site that we use in UCL for training um, archaeologists, ones who come in as undergraduates, and we took our young archaeologist club. What everyone wants to do is to dig you know, no matter how much you show them geophysical, um, uh, you know, uh, instruments, how much you show them aerial photographs, what they want to do is to do what they think archaeologists do, and of course they do 
a lot of the time is to dig. And that's what they want to do. So to overcome this problem, Museum of London started, but other people did it as well. They started to, um, to introduce the idea of simulated excavation. And they have wooden boxes into which are put created walls and pits and post holes and such with sand put in, with objects placed, and then children can excavate it. Uh, and they have to draw it, they have to measure it, and then they talk about the finds afterwards. Um, and this is uh, also done here uh, in different ways. A copy of it done on the right in Canterbury, which I'm going to um, come back to in just a moment. And then another favorite thing is to do it in a rather crude way with sand, a hole in the ground, and put sand in and then put fines in. I don't favor that myself. I think it's amount to, uh, you know, saying here's a sand pit, play in it. And you have to be very careful about the age of children doing it uh, as well. Uh, so I decided in my difficult way to, uh, to create something uh, for a museum in the, in the east of England uh, which was, I th think, a much better experience. And that was to have a hole in the ground uh, and create within that some archaeological features, which I built myself, stone and concrete, um, and then put sand over the top so you can't see it, and then children helped by adults then start excavating it, and there are finds placed carefully in the surface, modern finds, and then more medieval ones further down. And further down, they are then excavating that. Now, they don't go so far as to believe that it's an archaeological site. I mean, I tell them it isn't to start with. But if you want to get the feel of it, and, and we talked about empathy, didn't we? They can empathize with what you can tell people till you're blue in the face, as it were, they don't believe you. You know, well, there might be something there, and it's extremely hard work. You have to shovel a lot of stuff away. Well, they have to do that here, so they learn. Community archaeology is, um, is a kind of peculiar peculiar thing in, in some ways um, because it rarely involves a community. Rarely. It rarely starts with a community. The one on the left uh, is, is from North Yorkshire, from, from Long Preston, and it does actually start with a community. A community uh, who were interested in archaeology and brought in an archaeologist to help them, and out of that developed uh, what's become a fairly standard um, one form of, of practice, which is to dig holes in people's gardens when they allow you to do it under the supervision of, ar of an archaeologist. So they learn about their own village. But it's, it's rarely coming from the community. This is the same place where I built the, I built the dig boxes, as they're called, and this was an archaeologist who, what, what's the phrase we use, helicopters in, says, oh, you've got a very interesting place here. I think what you want is an excavation. We'll call it a community excavation, and anyone can volunteer. Well, that seems to me like we did in the 1960s when we had big excavations and we asked people to volunteer. And then they went away. But what they did do that was good was to do the public thing at the bottom, telling all the people who didn't want to volunteer what it was, what it was like. I want now, very briefly, and I'm not going to get to the end of this now, um, I want to look at these, these case studies. The first is the, uh, is the building exploratory in Hackney in London. Very large population, but part of, part of London, set up by volunteers. Um, by amateurs who wanted to change people's views about basically about the architecture of their of of their place, 
um, and they, they got a school that was redundant and started to build, build within it. And what they've done, I think, is a, is a very professional job based on models uh, of the area, um, based on maps, so they can see how it's changed over time, with, which you can't see very well there, with drawers underneath each section, like Roman, early medieval, 19th century. And the person who's, who's teaching the, this group of children, who are a formal group, is one of my ex-students from a long time ago, who became the education officer there. So they're linking the archaeology with the architecture and, and, and the landscape. Um, and there again, they can see things in, in detail and they can look at photographs and they can, they can vote for you know, the, the, the best house or whatever it, whatever it is. They're doing activities all the time. And it's, they're very aware of the curriculum and how it might, how it might fit. The second case study is, is the Canterbury Archaeological Trust. We have a number of these still surviving in, in the UK, professional units of archaeologists um, employed to do mostly rescue, rescue work. Canterbury Archaeological Trust, like a lot of others, founded in the 70s, but has done, you can, you can read the text, I'm sure, has done really good work, in particular in, in education, but also in dealing with the public. Um, and here, a huge site, which is now a supermarket and shops in the middle of Canterbury, now all destroyed and built over, but open to the public in the way that the uh, in the way that the Temple of Mithras was open to the public, but um, with the distinction that they built, like a number of other places, um, viewing platforms in which they've incorporated activities. And the important thing to get from this slide is uh, that they're, they're doing activities with children, uh, they've got pub the public in, uh, and they're dealing with formal school groups. They're handling stuff, they get to talk to archaeologists. So it's outreach, but you're, you're drawing them in. They go out to schools, um, and they get schools to come in and look at their own sites where it's feasible. But they also do outreach by going to what is a really good venue, if you've got them in, you know, in your country, shopping precincts, malls. Um, you can generally negotiate with shopping precincts to put up um, charitable things rather than things to, to sell. And that's a good way to get to a large, number of, a large number of people. They produce resources for schools um, and they go into schools and do, and do object work. Have I got time just to zoom through very quickly? Okay, <clears throat> so Museum of London. And I don't know how many of you visited it. I, I, I favour two, two museums. Um, one is the Museum of London, and the other is the Museum at Patra, which I think is fantastic. If you haven't been there, you should have been there. I rarely find people who have been there, but it's, it's really fantastic. I don't know about the education service. I haven't looked at it yet, but the, you know, the, the way of displaying is, is really, really good. New museum. The Museum of London was new a long time ago. It's about to be changed and they're going to move to another building, so we understand. Um, but it's a modern building, so there's no, not, not the problem a lot of museums have of being in a historic building. You can't screw things to walls, you can't do this, you can't do that. They've got a modern building, so you can do what you want. They're also modern in the sense they start with the Stone Age and they end with yesterday right the way through. They're also terrific because they start with toddlers, tiny children crawling about on the ground with their mums and very occasionally dads, and they work right up to uh, adults, old age pensioners, disabled people, you name it within society, and they, they do something for them. Um, they do active work, um, drama work, um, first-person interpretation and uh, reading. 
And then finally, finally, and this will be very quick, um, to come back to the community excavation. One that I was particularly impressed with uh, was um, four, four years ago, I suppose it was. It's in a park in London, um, in East London. People walk through it all the time. and It's got archaeological remains within it, but underground. So they set it up. Um, the park is there. And there's a, a view of the, of the other part to emphasize that it's accessible, at least geographically accessible. And within that, they set up an excavation and they put up notices um, every day, as well as having blogs, they put up notices about what they found every single day. And every single day, hundreds of students from the further education college walk past these very signs. I, I show it because it, it's really unusual for this to happen in the UK. Um, they did an, an excavation with adults, not children, but with older students of a church which had been um, destroyed by bombing and, and only remained below ground. So there was excavation and there were finds from the excavation. So they did work with finds. You can see top top left, um, school groups came in and, and did activities and whatever. But the thing that really impressed me, that I'm, I'm going to absolutely finish with, it is the last slide, uh, is a project they did beyond the finds that archaeologists found. Um, we, we talked yesterday about the other, didn't we? And we, you know, that the other is, is uh, is much more evident, I think, than you know, we give it credit for, as it were, philosophically, it, okay, but as an educationist, the other is a field with the remains of a Roman villa in it. You know, you may as well be a person from Mars as the village that you've just walked out of, because how do you understand, you all understand it, and we've got to as archaeologists and heritage managers understand that they don't understand unless we find ways of getting to the other. Now empathy is good, but what you need are stepping stones to get there. Imagine it as a, you know, a, a, as a swamp in between you and what you want to take them to. How do you get there? Well, you, you need to create educational stepping stones, which is where formal education comes in. Anyway, they took this as, a, as, a, uh, as an opportunity to uh, work with another organization and, and do a project on objects. And they said very simply to all these hundreds of people who walk through this park every day, um, we're interested in objects. Have you got any objects that you think we might be interested in? If you're prepared to leave your object, we'll show you how you can display it, how you can write a label. And it emphasized to them that, that archeologists never get this amount of information, never. You might just about find the name of a potter from an ancient civilization, but you won't know whether the Potter was married, had one leg, anything. You don't know anything about them at all, nothing at all. You just know it's, it's a name. And we as archaeologists treasure that bit of information because we know we're not going to get anything else. But the, real, the real, real objects people use have got histories and memories, and people brought, brought their memories and put them on the table. A, you know, a very interesting uh, experiment which I still do with my with my students with modern objects so there we are that's that's it really I, I'm not going to sum up because there isn't there isn't time I'll only say it all over again so thank you very much for being very patient Thanks.